waiting for one of the speaker to come in. So. Is that Ambassador Feekin? Come up here and join us. We've been waiting for you. I think there's a few seats up here in the front row, uh, a couple over there. Come on, come on in. So welcome everybody. Um, this is the panel on tech nationalism, 5G, cybersecurity, and trade. It sounds like a mouthful, but uh, all of those concepts and issues are very closely interrelated. And uh, we have a very good uh, panel here today to uh, take on what has become, uh, at least in my country, an incredibly controversial issue in which, uh, frankly, there's too many people sort of spouting off their position without engaging in dialogue with people with different positions. So we thought we would put together a, uh, a discussion in which we brought together uh, uh, many different sides of this issue. Uh, tech nationalism is a, is a term that uh, we at the Internet Governance Project have been using for a couple of years now. Uh, as we notice the tendency for uh, cybersecurity and Internet governance issues to become more and more in, intertwined with national security issues. And uh, some, both Bill and I come from an, uh, an arena and a policy domain in which uh, we spent uh, 20 years liberalizing uh, telecommunications industry and introducing uh, free trade across borders. And now we're seeing many of those uh, gains uh, reversed or challenged by uh, this rise of what we call tech nationalism. Uh, do you want to add anything, Bill? By the way, this is my co-moderator, Bill Drake, and uh, he is a, a professor at the uh, University of Zurich. Yes, and there's a very long and complicated name of your department. Um, I'm a professor at the School of Public Policy, which is a very simple name, at the Georgia, Georgia Institute of Technology. So there you go. Well, first of all, I have to tell you that Milton and I have been friends for 30 years and have never tried to do anything together because we violently disagree 20% of the time. So this is, our, this is a maiden voyage, so this will be fun for us. Um, anyway, uh, welcome everybody. Yes, I'm Bill Drake. He's Milton Mueller. Uh, just a few thoughts I would make about tech nationalism to start. One is that it has, the concept has a long and not very illustrious history. Um, and no political system is immune from tech nationalism. We had in, during the Cold War, uh, you know, the uh, whole tech nationalist fervor around uh, Sputnik being raised, uh, and then the missile gap, et cetera. The Americans were all alarmed about that. Canadians, for a long time, had a lot of techno-nationalist debates around the need for sovereign telecommunications and media, et cetera. The French 
had very Gaullist kinds of discussions around the need to combat IBM's hegemony by building up national champions in the computer industry. So there's a long history to techno-nationalism. Um, what's new, I think, is that uh, it's no longer just a def domestic defensive posture. Tech-nationalism has become very much an international expansionist approach that's tied into international power politics and geoeconomics. And also, it's, we've seen it really extend beyond the realm of hardware, where it used to be focused, to issues like services, applications, clouds, and especially data, which is a sort of new turn. So when Vladimir Putin says whoever controls AI in the future will control the world, he is giving you precisely that sort of a tech-nationalist vision of uh, control via data and the manipulation of data, et cetera. Rarely do people who are tech nationalists call themselves tech nationalists, which is interesting. It's, it's a term very few people will stand up, fly a flag, say I'm a tech nationalist. And there's no consensus definition about what tech nationalism means uh, in the social sciences or anywhere else. So it's a deeply contested concept and one which therefore uh, allows for a lot of back and forth about exactly what counts is tech nationalism, what doesn't, is this an appropriate term to be levying in a particular case, et cetera. So it's all very interesting, and I think we're gonna have a very robust and interesting discussion. Do you wanna introduce the panels? Yes, I will, I will. Um... And we haven't practiced this. <laughs> For the sake of time, I will tell you what their names are and basically uh, their positions, if I can get that right, and then uh, when they uh, speak. We're going to have a structured presentation uh, of this concept. Uh, so uh, going from your right to left, we have uh, Ambassador Tobias Fiekin from Australia. He's the official cyber ambassador for Australia, as I understand it. And then we have Jan-Peter Kleinhans, and uh, he is with a, a research foundation in Germany, and he has been focusing on uh, 5G and Internet of Things technology. We have here Jyoti Pandey, and she is with the Indian Institute of Management, and she also has been writing about uh, data sovereignty to some extent, and also some 5G uh, policy-related materials. And then on our left over here, we have Mr. Morrissey, who is the Washington, D.C. lobbyist for Huawei. And uh, I... Uh, I have to say, I have been trying to get uh, actual official representatives of Huawei involved in these conversations for some time, and uh, I think typical of Chinese companies, they have preferred to uh, sort of stay under the weather. Uh, or <laughs> Maybe that too. Uh, so uh, it's great to have uh, somebody openly speaking uh, and uh, talking about that position. So why don't I turn it over to Bill now for our first round to tell us what uh, the first round is about and how we're going to go about it. So what we're doing actually is dividing this up into basically uh, four rounds of quest, three rounds of questions. Uh, and I'm gonna take the lead on the first, Milton will do the second, and then we'll kind of conspire on the third. I wanna point out to the people who are standing in the back of the room, if you're happy where you are, that's fine, but there are lots of seats sprinkled around in the front, uh, which you could certainly take if you wanted to sit down. It's your call. Um, so the first session, uh, the first segment for 15 minutes, we're going to talk about the nature of techno-nationalism. What is it and, and how is it manifested and so on. Again, as I said, there's no singular definition about it, but I think often there's a number of different elements that we can point to. There's usually an other that can allegedly would dominate or threaten the security of an us in the absence of some kind of state action without a foreign threat. Techno-nationalism doesn't seem to work as a discourse. Technonationalism is invariably, in my view, a statist project, and very often a state building project that builds, that binds social actors to the state via various levels of support, protection, restricted choice, and so on, and gets intimately bound up with notions of national sovereignty, which the state itself is positioned as the only actor to defend. Uh, unless the state will build and operate the technology itself, there's usually a politically connected set of businesses that would benefit from the redirected resources that would occur uh, if you have, pursue a techno-nationalist policy, so some social interests behind it. It works well, in particular, in concentrated political systems where, there, where power is not diffused over multiple different domains. Um, it works as well best when you've got third parties that are willing to give voice to the discourse, who are credible thought leaders or 
as the Russians would say, useful idiots who would propagate the ideas uh, throughout the, the political system. And it works best when uh, it's unilateral and non-reciprocal. If everybody else is techno-nationalist too, then of course it becomes much more difficult and much more of a, a source of conflict. So it's a very interesting sort of uh, domain and it's very much bound up with a lot of the current kinds of discussions we're having now about tech lash, uh, data panics, GAFA derangement syndrome, uh, which, which I think is pervasive. And it's uh, stimulated by the transition to a multipolar or perhaps uh, heteropolar world order uh, in the international political system. So let's start with the question of what is techno-nationalism and how widespread is it in the industrialized and developing worlds? Um, I'd like to hear thoughts from the panelists along that line in whatever order. Would you like to start, Ambassador? Do you, do you know how to work this one? Work this thing? I think they're all on. Everyone can hear me. Good stuff. Um, <clears throat> what is tech-nationalism? Um, let me um, just, just revolve back. And, and sorry, sorry for being a government rep and just explaining a little bit about the position and where it came from, because I think it also helps in terms of a bit of reflection of, of the position over the three years and what we've seen in the international environment. So in 2016-17, this position was put in place by the, by the Australian government as part of a cybersecurity strategy um, to uh, represent the fact that cyber issues were becoming a strategic policy um, part of uh, part of the strategic policy discussion for leaders, for senior ministers, for, for business leaders. Um, and it was felt that you, uh, as a government, the Australian government needed a senior figurehead who could bring together everything we wanted to achieve as a country in the cyber sphere and project that into the international environment. So you could, if you like, see the beginnings of that change. And actually myself, I've come from outside of government in. So before I was in government, I was looking at some of these trends already um, and, and how it evolved. Um, so that's where the position began. Now, I, I, I didn't think, I don't think, hand on heart, I could have predicted how things have developed over the last three years. Because if we thought that this kind of position was important three years ago, when we were talking about cyberspace and the importance of you know, law norms, security principles, of human rights online, and the kinds of economic um, benefits that we wanted from cyberspace, well, well, now we find ourselves in a time where you know, technology is front and center of geopolitics, and as you said rightly in your introduction. So more than ever, there's pressure on positions like this to be able to engage not just with other governments who are taking, if you like, more and more broader strategic tech policy decisions, and you're seeing that wherever you look in the world now, um, and I think a lot of governments now are stepping back and thinking, well, what is it that we want out of technology? What is, if you like, our grand strategy for technology? And it's interesting, I keep trying to scratch my head and think of a good historical example where you could bring together the multitude of different maturing, emerging critical technologies um, and, and point to a similar time in history where you had quite so many technologies maturing at such a similar rate, which will have such a profound impact on the way our economies run, the way our national security uh, is delivered um, and maintained, and also how our societies actually evolve and what they look like in the future. So that asks of us profound questions as policymakers. Well, how do we ensure that we're engaging in the right way internationally to ensure um, and I'm not afraid to use these terms, our values, our principles are actually there in the technology development cycle. So I guess if you think about, well, what does tech nationalism mean through, I mean, I would never say that, you know, Australia is a tech nationalist, but I guess, you know, the mere fact that we are prioritizing this area of policy development, we're taking a more strategic view of how we look at the technology space and what it is we want out of that in our national interest and our societal interest, that in of itself would indicate the kind of centrality of these issues to any country wherever they might be. And now obviously we are not a major superpower, so it's not like we are the main tech hub that's going to be developing a lot of these technologies, but we see there as being a profound role for us to be speaking about these issues, to be trying to assist in the shaping of the environment in which these technologies are absorbed into our societies. And I think we'll probably get into some of that conversation during the course of this. Thank you. Great. That was very helpful. Jan Peter, what do you think? Thanks. Um, so I'm focused very much on IoT security policy and, and 5G security. Um, and I, I like to talk about concrete examples uh, that I think explain why quickly when we talk about IT security, we end up 
at national security and in the worst case in tech nationalism. And in the example of 5G, this is actually pretty much straightforward. Uh, why is that? Well, if you look at, a, at, at today's ICT systems or, um, or mobile networks or telecommunication networks, you can exploit those in two different ways. You can exploit a software vulnerability or um, a vulnerability in the configuration. Because of our um, systems being so complex, we are talking about hundreds of millions of lines of code, so there's always a vulnerability somewhere that someone can exploit. But that's not the only way, because against this, we kind of know what to do. We set up requirements from, from a government perspective. We define um, security requirements that have to be fulfilled for a particular vendor or operator. But then the second way to exploit a network is through legitimate access. Because of highly complex systems, the vendor um, and the operator always need to cooperate um, to maintain the network, uh, to fix vulnerabilities, um, to solve problems. So the national operator, which typically the government has a very close relationship with, um, depends on the foreign equipment vendor that might have to um, abide by foreign laws. And that creates the national security dimension. No matter how many security requirements and technical specifications I release as a government, at the end of the day, my operator has to rely on the vendor um, to not exploit the network. And in this dimension, um, trustworthiness plays a role. And I think um, the, the Snowden revelations were actually the best example. What happened during the Snowden revelations was that Europe and China realized that because of the US technological leadership, they exploited network infrastructure for surveillance purposes and law enforcement. And that resulted in a loss of trust uh, in Europe, uh, which meant a loss of uh, revenues for US uh, cloud providers. And then the lobbying started, and we saw open letters from Cisco, from Google, from Microsoft, and others who asked for government reform. There is now a rich ecosystem of um, technology um, think tanks in the U.S. who all work on surveillance policy reform. We have um, Apple and other companies bringing the U.S. government in front of the court um, to fight against uh, breaking encryption, to fight against handing over customer data. So if I compare the first one and a half years of the U.S. debate um, after the Snowden revelations with the first one and a half years around the Huawei debate, um, you can see why the regulatory environment um, matters. The origin of technology matters. Because the regulatory environment of, an, of a vendor has impact on its perceived trustworthiness. So now the, for me the question is to avoid tech nationalism, it's actually not about countries like, you, uh, it's actually not about companies like you said. It's about countries figuring out how to deal in a increasingly software-defined world based on mutually agreed criteria and how long it will take specifically for China to realize that the Chinese regulatory system um, has a detrimental um, effect internationally on its company's trustworthiness. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. We will dive into the 5G case more detailed in the second round of questions led by Milton. But at this point, I'm still trying to get on the table the core concept. Is tech nationalism a meaningful term? Uh, is it worth talking about these issues in, these, in this way? Uh, Jyoti, do you have thoughts about that? Um, thanks, Bill. Um, so I work, um, I research telecom markets and looking at how platforms and data uh, regulations are shaping the geopolitical order as well as um, domestic policies. And in India, there's certainly been a rise of techno-nationalism, both um, in terms of a strategy that is guiding technology policy and also in terms of a larger policy aimed at um, when cooperating with other states or building relationships at an international order. And there are several factors that have contributed to India's position in the past few years. Firstly, the rise of China has proven to um, techno-nationalist that, you know, it is possible to actually have a 
techno-nationalist agenda and use it as development policy. And while doing that, you can also um, avoid the Western-led uh, institutional order that is in place. So this, over the years, has added support to these ideas. It's not that these ideas didn't exist maybe a decade back, but they've come to the forefront because of China's stupendous rise in standards development, in design of equipment and IP. Uh, especially, which is uh, ambitions that India shares with uh, East Asian countries as well as China. Um, we also have, but we do see India um, exercising restraint in its um, policies, if not in its policies, then certainly in, a, in its positions of how it demonstrates or talks about this agenda, because uh, it has to balance its uh, domestic capabilities and the needs of its markets and the kind of cooperation needed um, to actually bring services to people and meet their demands, as well as with its growing agenda to actually be a, a technology leader. So we see, for example, um, on 5G, India has not really come out with a clear position on whether Huawei will be participating or not. But at the same time, it's continued to stress the idea of technology sovereignty um, in not just 5G-related um, issues, but also on data and uh, platform governance issues. We've also seen um, in telecommunications itself, um, um, certain um, companies that are receiving state backing uh, where policies have been um, immensely favorable to them, if not um, uh, deliberately done, but have certainly suited their particular position in the market and uh, work to consolidate them as leaders. Um, you also see a rise of lobby groups and domestic industry groups that have been pushing forward the idea of tech nationalism. Um, and um, for example, on e-commerce, India has been going back and forth on uh, allowing um, you know, foreign companies to invest in the market. So the idea of techno-nationalism is not restricted to one kind of technology in India. It's spread across a wide variety of verticals. Um, but it's also evolving in a very context, in a context that is specific to that particular technology because the markets and the demands and the country's reality around those technology are at different stages of development. So between those, uh, we have quite an interesting and um, complicated tech nationalist agenda in India. India is having very interesting debates around these issues. Uh, Don, your thoughts on tech nationalism? Since I deal with <coughs> policymakers, and nobody accuses them of being practical, they do day-to-day -day business in the practical real world. So looking around at, at, at the, the idea of tech nationalism, I think you could see, you could see looking around the world, it exists in several forms. You have technology bans and restrictions. You have technical security reviews, requirements and technical. You have export controls. You have international trade agreements. You have investment restrictions. You have ownership limitations. And you have data localization requirements and adherence to domestic uh, data standards. Um, all these, I think the framework, if you look at that framework, what exists today, they all, they all interact at a locus of national security, cyber security, and a third category, which, which loosely defined as innovation, uh, trade, and industrial co competition. So th all these forms of what someone might label tech nationalism interact with those three loci, which are very important to understand. Now, there are many good reasons for different governments or different sovereign <coughs> states to enact something that impinges or one, one or, or more of these. For example, one could argue GDPR is techno-nationalism. At the same time, it is a reaction to a market need that said, we're worried about data privacy in this sovereign territory. So there's a, there's a balance there. Sometimes it goes over one way or goes over the other. Um, so the trick here is to look at, in each of those categories, at the loci of those three main forces, is to look at what the proper balance is. For Huawei, when you look at it, uh, we have always looked at end-to-end -end, uh, end -end, um, validation, third-party validation of security, um, as well as getting it right from the start, but end-to-end, -end, from core to peripheral. I think if you have, if you look at these three loci, national security, cyber security, and trade and innovate, uh, trade and innovation, you need a roadmap if you're going to best strike the balance between those three loci uh, over which tech nationalism exists. I think we would, I would headline it in several categories. One, you have to you have to set security baselines globally 
okay, both locally and globally. You have to manage the security in your development phase. This is for private companies as well as government. You have to, you have, to have third party inspection, evaluation, and certification. And you have to manage security vulnerabilities, which will always exist. And you have to um, have operations and configured management for the operations of in the net and, and for telecom operators. And you have to ensure transparency and accountability of that security. If you take those basic guideposts, and there are lots of per number of how the, those are operationalized. Now, um, those are just really the headlines. If you look around the world, particularly in Europe and the US, and, and in Australia as well, there are, there are some good news of sovereign states going in the right, certain right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction at the same time. For example, the NESAS combined with 3GPP gives you the beginnings of looking at uh, credibility in, ter in terms of both the vendor products as well as the operational of the networks. Um, and so you have the beginnings of that. Likewise, in the U.S., uh, the U.S. passed a milestone cyber, uh, supply chain cybersecurity bill related to federal procurement last year. It's a good step. It outlines basic criteria that, that should be used elsewhere. But then you can have what I would consider wrong steps where the balance between the three, again, national security, cybersecurity, <clears throat> and innovation, um, can go athwart. For example, recently in Congress, there were two bills passed by the respective Senate and House uh, uh, Commerce Committees which essentially say, which essentially say uh, we want to develop a 5G industry that is in these certain countries defined as those countries that have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. Well, to quote Barack Obama, hello 1980. All right. So um, is that going too far? Well, in some parts. In some parts of, that, of those bills, they say that we should have mutual testing facilities and, and, and mutual development of innovation. That's good. But if you confine that to a Cold War framework for those members in or out, um, that may be that if you get to that extreme, which was in the initial draft of one of the one of the pieces of legislation, then you may be getting then you may be striking an imbalance between those three foci. And then we can discuss that further. Thank you, Don. Very interesting. And I have to say, when you said GDPR could be viewed as techno-nationalism, I saw a number of eye eyebrows go up. So that may be fodder for interesting discussion when we get to the Q&A. We will try to save 20, 30 minutes at the end of this for open discussion amongst everybody, because I'm sure many people ha have views. I'd just like to turn to my co-moderator. If you, Do you have any thoughts on the, the broad question of techno-nationalism? What is it, et cetera? Yeah, I would like to put forward a more uh, political economy definition of it. I think we... Um, we got a little too uh, in the weeds of the specific technologies. I like the way Jody approached the issue. Um, to my mind, the, the essence of tech nationalism is the perception of technology as an instrument or secondary benefit for national competition. That, you know, in the sort of globalized market that we tried to create with telecom uh, and liberalization of trade, uh, we had companies competing to serve markets which were global, and now that concept is being reversed to the extent that we're seeing states define themselves and their power as the object of competition and not so much the consumers and, and the civil society. And so I think the, the concept of tech nationalism has to be linked to the resurgence of other forms of nationalism, everything from the restrictions on immigration that you see uh, as a backlash in the United States and Europe. Uh, you see uh, the uh, trade protectionism and the, and the use of tariffs. Uh, uh, this is all part of the same deal. It's simply the extension of that the nationalistic logic to the technology sphere. But fundamentally, then, it is kind of a statist reaction to techno national, to techno globalism. Exactly. The, the 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 bad word in in Trump's America now is uh, globalist. That's uh, what you were not supposed to be. And of course, what is the internet? It is, you know, inherently global in the sense that it's a standard that is universally applicable for data communication anywhere in the world. So if you're not in favor of globalism, you're probably questioning the interconnectivity of the internet protocols. Okay. Um, I want to say, by the way, going forward, I think we should try to be concise and limit our initial comments to 
two to three minutes max so that we can make sure we get through all the questions and leave enough time for people uh, to discuss. I have one last question I want to ask in this opening bit, and then we'll turn it over to Milton to, to lead us through 5G. Um, there has uh, been in recent years a sort of interesting subspecies of uh, techno-nationalism, which you might call data nationalism, in which uh, data is viewed as essentially a, a national resource to be protected by the state. And speaking of India, I have here on my head this wonderful book, Data Sovereignty, The Pursuit of Supremacy, written by four lieutenant generals in India uh, and uh, three other people tied to the Hindu nationalist government, which basically makes the argument in very strong and floral language that data is the collective property of uh, the people and the voice of the people is the state, therefore the state should be in charge of data and it, it is the appropriate function of the state to battle against the forces of global, techno-globalism and assert its authority over data. Now, how, how, do we, how do we view this question? This is a, the, the extension of the techno-nationalist rationale to the realm of data is a very interesting one. Ambassador, do you have any uh, thoughts on that that you'd like to share? It sounded to me as though we were directing that towards an Indian perspective. No, I'm, but, I'm asking um, all of us. Sure. I mean, look, in terms of data localization, I, I, I mean, if you want to put something which is top of when I go into a bilateral meeting, it's always one of the top agenda items is a conversation around data localization. Where does the Australian government stand on this? Um, well, we, you know, we, we're all about the idea of free flow of data. Um, of course, there are certain parts of our government data holdings that we always want to have on shore, and you know, that, that long may that remain, but we're acutely aware that if you're using a, a, a really good cloud service provider, the kinds of security provisions that you will be given with that cloud security provider will be infinitely better than, than potentially having to deal with all of the data holdings yourself. But um, in, in the international environment, it's becoming used as a very, um, I would say, kind of nationalist position, which is, well, if the data is stored here, it's therefore much safer because it's stored here. And, and in many cases, that can be a misnomer and actually incredibly misleading um, because the kinds of security that is actually provided on shore, and I'm not obviously going to go into names of particular countries that I'm mm -hmm. talking to on that front, will not be anywhere near what a decent cloud provider can actually give you. Um, so the, the danger there is you start making economic decisions which lead you down uh, a bit of a rabbit hole and will lead to worse economic consequence than actually if you were looking at the broader solutions. Can I just ask for a quick clarification of something? When people in Australia say there are certain kinds of data that should remain on shore, if they had guaranteed access to the data offshore, would the location of the data actually matter? Does it matter where the server racks are if you have guaranteed access to the data whenever you need it? So I mean, I'm talking about the incredibly highly classified environment, and that for us is something that is quite different, and to mm -hmm. be honest, off the table for discussion. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that in that sense, it's a very different conversation we're having. But if we're talking more broadly, where in government we have adopted a you know a cloud service provider, and you know we're quite comfortable with the way that operates and works, and the kinds of data access that we have to that, um, wherever it is actually stored, it's that. We're comfortable with that equation. So what I'm talking about is the incredibly classified world, and I think everyone would understand why you would want to, if you can provide higher levels of reassurance, which you would do for that kind of data, then it's quite obvious why you keep it on shore. Okay, Jan Peter. We don't have time to go. So I think okay, that um, we'll the, the the issue at hand is that we have to separate between um, IT security and um, privacy or data, data protection. IT security uh, is an engineering challenge. Data protection uh, is about law and protection of, uh, uh, of human rights. Um, so in that sense, we, we have the interesting situation that um, a company, a cloud provider, whoever, can be stellar uh, in IT security domain but can be questionable in the data protection um, regulation. And that's why, speaking as a European, I can fully understand that um, things like GDPR happened. <laughs> they happened for a reason. Um, simply because it's not so much, not so much about the, the, the physical location. Of course, it doesn't matter if a, um, if a server um, is, a server is not more secure in Munich than in Berlin, um, but it's about the jurisdiction and the laws that apply to this particular server. So we have to square the circle that, yes, 
there's free flow of data in the internet, but no jurisdic jurisdiction still matters. And that then leads, again, quite quickly to, to tech nationalism and um, the false argument that um, data is more secure in a certain location. No, of course it's not, but it's about the jurisdiction and the, the legal regime that applies to the data if it's stored in a particular uh, location. Jyoti, so is data the collective property of the people, like machine-to-machine -machine data generated in a value chain by a global corporation? Is that the collective property of the Indian people that should be protected by the Indian state? According to one of the policies that was issued recently in India, it is. But um, this policy is at the draft stage, and there are obviously discussions that are going on. But to just step back for a moment, and with the caveat that I am not pro-data localization, um, there are certain, um, India is not the only country that is contesting how these boundaries or rules should be drawn up for data. And data governance is a concern with uh, countries that are, you know, industrialized or that are developing. Um, in India's context, I think it's largely been driven, these data um, localization or data sovereignty-based approaches are driven by two big um, arcs, which is that, you know, uh, data has become really important for all sorts of industries and not just the high technology sectors. Um, and as it gets integrated with the economy, you know, obviously um, the kind of control that governments want over uh, it has expanded uh, proportionately. Um, also, the value that is derived from this data is largely flowing back to a few companies, a few countries, or a few, um, you know, regions. And uh, rightly so, India wants to uh, negotiate its place uh, in a more uh, in a manner which kind of benefits it a bit more than where it stands to benefit if it continues with the status quo. And I would um, urge people to think of data localization more as a negotiation tactic mm -hmm. rather than a set policy uh, stance that is not open to either revision or um, is actually uh, really deterministic. Um, so data localization is a Trumpian move, is in other words. Uh, <laughs> That's my reading of it. I'll be very brief. As a vendor, Huawei has to, compl has to comply for the, its customers in 180 different markets. So we're very aware of the various jurisdictions, which is a very, very, very important part. But also as a vendor going forward and in the past, you have to look at the, all vendors should be very, should be, you should have third party evaluation of how data is accessed, if it's accessed. In Huawei's case, it's only accessed at the permission of the customer and under very strict guidelines. So we're not a data holder, but the vendors have to come under both, under that kind of scrutiny as well. Uh, also with, with transparency and I think third party verification of who has access to the data and how that access is performed. Okay, so then let's drill down into the case of 5G and Huawei and the, all the fun things going on. This is of particular interest to my colleague, Milton, so why don't you take right. the lead on this? I will. So uh, I don't know about uh, other countries, but in the United States, there's a tremendous amount of hype about 5G uh, as if it were, I think somebody said, you know, the movement from 3G to 4G was like uh, moving from a donkey to a horse. and and movement to 5G is like uh, the industrial revolution and the steam engine. And uh, I wanna say I actually don't accept that. I'm historically aware of all of the Gs and, and what kind of advances they brought. But it, when you add that hype, uh, again, because of tech nationalism, it gets worked into a national competition. So we are told in the United States that if we are not leading in 5G and China is leading, then we will be in trouble, that China will have more power than us or they may even take over our country, it's not clear. <laughs> and, and then you get into the fact that uh, one of the main vendors of 5G core network equipment is, um, is a, a Chinese company, which is a, a, by all measures, a private company, and then you get contestation around whether there is such a thing as a, pri a Chinese company that is private and whether it is really an agent of the state, of the Chinese state, and so you get in, into another tech nationalist narrative about it's not really about Huawei or the cybersecurity of Huawei, it's about uh, the U.S. versus China, and the U.S. is going around the world trying to convince every country that it can to shut Huawei out of its markets just as we have done in the United States. 
So with that framing, now let's turn, because I believe Australia in particular is one of the countries that has uh, banned Huawei from its uh, national broadband network, I think. Um, I'd like to know, you know, what's going on with that? What exactly do you think is being uh, accomplished? Uh, do you view Huawei as an arm of the state? Let's begin with that. And you'll probably understand that I'm not going to get drawn into that exact kind of conversation. Um, so um, what I will do is I'll frame it my way and also <laughs> like that. Um, and the way the Australian right. government views Fra this. Frame away. Frame away, okay. Um, so you, you want to understand the basis. Um, we do have form for this, for making fairly robust decisions on who may or may not provide core backbone infrastructure kit. Um, and you rightly said, for our national broadband network back in 2012, we made very strong decisions about who could actually provide equipment into the core of our national broadband network. So we have form in this. Um, in, in in terms of our 5G decision, I mean, firstly, I'll say it over and over again through this panel, and this is as far as you'll get with me, this is a vendor agnostic, country agnostic decision that we made around sets of principles on absorbing where we fundamentally disagree with your framing of this, that 5G actually is one of the most fundamentally game-changing pieces of infrastructure our country will ever introduce. So that means that you have a requirement upon you as a policymaker to think very clearly about who is then going to build that infrastructure? Who is going to then have access to that kind of infrastructure? And that's the process that we then proceeded to go through. Um, and it's a long-term decision. This isn't about making a decision for you know, the next near-term political cycle and thinking about you know, one year down the track and are you going to get voted in or not? It's nothing to do with that. And, and I'll also state, when we made our decision in August 2018, this was way ahead of anyone else actually really discussing this issue and the kind of depth that we now find ourselves in. And, you know, I don't avoid any kind of 5G discussion. It's always on the agenda. But we were well ahead of the pack on this. And one of the reasons for that is that we had telecommunications firms demanding market certainty who said, we'll go ahead and do what we think is right for our own business unless we get some kind of direction from you and we would prefer some market certainty so that we make the right investments for ourselves, for our customers and for Australia. So that was a, a big impetus to push the decision down the, along. At well, a certainly if I were a telecom uh, equipment or, or a, an operator in Australia, I wouldn't want to go out and buy a bunch of equipment that then the government told me two years later I had to rip out and, uh, and get rid of. Well, absolutely not. I mean, it makes bad economic sense, doesn't it? And actually, you know, th this, that was a core part of our consideration as well. And, and whilst it's really being framed in the media as purely a national security decision, that, you know, it's not the case. It's saying, well, five, ten years down the track, when we have a mature, mature 5G network, if we don't have certainty in the provider of that network, well, then we lose our own economic certainty. And if all the risks that we perceive there can be in that network are there, then it doesn't give us good economic certainty as well. How can we trust the underpinnings of our own economy if we feel we have a high-risk vendor, wherever they might come from, um, supplying that backbone infrastructure. So if you like, that, that's the beginning of the conversation and we can get into some of the intricacies of you know, core periphery and a 5G network and the well, mitigation approaches if you want. What I'd like to do now is, is possibly get uh, uh, the Huawei representative involved because I have seen a particularly interesting sort of uh, article that circulated in Australia uh, from uh, somebody from Huawei saying basically your, your national broadband network is a failure and uh, that's one of the reasons that it is is because you didn't allow uh, one of the most efficient vendors into the market. Is uh, let's let's hear from you on that. I hadn't seen that article, so I can't comment specifically to that. But the, oh, senti darn. the sentiments I can agree with. I think one of the, one of the issues uh, that you're looking at with, with sovereign governments on the issue of trust, uh, as mentioned before, it gets not to the issue of trust in the specific product or the operations, but trust in the in the country of origin. Um, the problem we have here, and you see this in the United States as well, when you're looking at <clears throat> other vendors in the industry, um, where, where, where is their global supply chain? If you look at our competitors, their global supply chain, too, uh, aside from, from the depth and, and, and breadth of it, uh, looks the same as Huawei's. Um, it, about a third from the United States, about a third from China, and about a third from Europe and Taiwan. 
So the opportunities looking at country of origin or headquarters for a specific company is a fallacy because the opportunity for mischief by a, by a sovereign agent or a sovereign government occurs in that supply chain regardless. So where do you look, where do you look to for actual, actual risk assurance or risk security? You look at the operations and the methods and you look at verification of third party, and third party challenges to both the integrity of the product and the integrity of the operations and the integrity of the system. Looking at country of origin doesn't get you very far when you realize, for example, as quoted by the U.S. FCC commissioner, 40% of the U.S. telecom networks have Chinese products in them. They're not Huawei, I guarantee that, okay? So you have, so if you're going to look, you have to get in an increasingly evolving and faster evolving, you know, the, the acceleration of, of, of evolution in terms of technology requires evolving standards and tougher standards, which Huawei applauds and Huawei has worked for very hard. So uh, let's turn now to Jan Peter. So um, one of the arguments that we hear is, uh, and, and this is gonna sound maybe a little bit crazy, but I can point you to the speech where this was said by a US State Department representative, so that when we buy Chinese uh, high technology equipment, uh, the China is, uh, they're all agents of the Chinese state and they are exporting Chinese authoritarianism into the US by buying us. So I'll just turn that question around. When, when China buys a, um, uh, what is it, a, uh, the Swedish uh, Ericsson or Nokia, would, uh, would we be able to export uh, European liberalism to China if they bought the, uh, the boxes from Ericsson? Or, or what do you think? Do you think we're, we're trading uh, values when we trade these pieces of equipment? So I'm, I'm not a political scientist, and I'm, I'm certainly not um, a, a China expert. Um, but one thing is for sure, um, since humans design technology, there are social values in technology. But I think for the more concrete uh, policy debate around 5G, um, it's actually ripping out Chinese equipment out of your network does not make you more secure. It makes you more independent from, from China, but you still have to do all the legwork um, to secure ne your network. What I mentioned before, all the, the security requirements um, to improve the pretty abysmal state um, of IT security in mobile networks. But ripping out Chinese equipment um, addresses one particular attack vector. And that's the chance that the Chinese government coerces one of their vendors to compromise a foreign network that uses this equipment. Theoretically, any government has this chance because a company has to follow the laws of its particular jurisdiction, right? And that's, this that's the point, is that that argument works both ways. So it would apply to Apple, for example. Yeah, but, but, but here's the thing. It would apply to is, Google. It would have, yeah. you know, here's it, the thing. This is why I, why I said before that there are um, similarities or there's a benefit to, um, to um, compare it to the Snowden debate. Yeah. And then you, you identify the difference in government. Because, um, frankly speaking, we are now one and a half years at least into the Huawei debate. Um, in one and a half years after Snowden, we have seen public officials from the US government uh, talking pretty much openly about uh, US government reform of surveillance practices. Um, I think two or three years ago, we had the head of NSA's tailored access operations giving a presentation about how the NSA is infiltrating networks. Uh, we had the reform of the U.S. Patriot Act. Uh, we have a substantive uh, debate about transparency of surveillance measures. Yo, so Peter, so, I got, I got so now, corrected. just wait, wait one, one, one more minute. Um, I just have to give you a fact there. All of those things you talked about apply to domestic citizens of the United States. There was also a reform of the, of the FISA, of the um, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So that's not quite right. But anyways, yeah. it's about the level of government transparency towards certain um, practices and, and legislation and being open about how the government interprets this type of regulation. Now just compare this to the Chinese government and what they did in the past one and a half years regarding the Huawei debate. And I think that makes pretty clear that we talk about different types of government, we talk about different, very different political systems, 
And these simply have an impact on the perceived trustworthiness um, of a vendor. And that, that's, we shouldn't be naive about it. Vendors are not equal because they come out of different um, regulatory environments. So now the, the ball is, uh, I think, in the field of the governments um, to, to have a hard look at their own regulation and accept that the national regulation impacts the competitiveness um, of their companies abroad simply because of trustworthiness. And if everything is software in the future, IT security and trustworthiness will play a role in almost every aspect of our lives. Okay, so I think that that's one of the key issues here is indeed the equation of the vendor with the state uh, uh, from which it is exported. And I think that if we can't create a separation between them, then we really are headed to a world of technationalism because it means that China definitely doesn't trust the United States government. And it would be very difficult, I think, to tell a Chinese person, uh, let uh, Google or, or any vendor set up uh, and own networks in China. We've been fighting this issue for since the 90s, uh, is whether foreigners can own telecom equipment, uh, telecom facilities in China. And they're, they're saying, no, we can't do that. So how do we get out of the box of uh, bordered national systems and bordered national vendors if we accept that logic that we we can't trust the state uh, and therefore we can't trust the vendor, even though the vendor's entire business depends on global marketing and sales of its, of its equipment. Can I just ask you, are you asserting that China itself has never done this? No, no, I, I'm okay. totally down with the idea that China is very much into surveillance. I think they're a little more focused on their own domestic population and their immediate region. Uh, but I, I don't think that, uh, my point is that the, the U.S., we know the U.S. has done it, uh, and probably... Uh, talk about keeping foreign companies out of the market. Keeping... I mean, Google, right. Facebook... Right, that's what I'm saying, is that that's what they do, based on the same rationale that is now being offered by the United States. That's what I'm saying. We're, we're headed into a logic of tech nationalism if we take that argument too far. But by the same token, I think I want to uh, turn back to uh, Morrissey here. Um, what you know, can you say to people who talk about the software dependency of 5G and the constant need for updates uh, and the intimate relationship between a software vendor and the operations, what can you say that would reassure people as to why they should uh, trust somebody so connected to the Chinese uh, state? Uh, well, we're not connected to the Chinese state. We're a private company in China. Uh, but, we, but it is proudly a Chinese company and obeys the laws uh, of the country it's in and, and, and all the markets it's in as well. But uh, when you get to the idea, there's a, there's, a, there's a popular perception that when you talk about just in a network, in a network area that a patch comes in much as an update comes to your device. That's not the way it works. The, ecosystem, the security ecosystem is owned by the operator and they test and retest before any patches go in. That gets more complicated in a 5G world, but that gets back to the issue of how do you set up the structures for your security baseline, manage that baseline and, man and manage the software and manage both the procedures by the operator of the ecosystem and the inputs from all the vendors. Uh, recently, a few months ago, the Department of Defense official said that we are looking at a zero trust network. We would not disagree with that. Um, our our um, the head of our global CSO once said, you know, he used years ago this coined phrase ABC: accept nothing, believe no one, and check everything. Now, that when you get granular, that gets very, very complicated. But in that regard, is if you take a framework. Um, and Huawei has this experience like no other vendor. If you look at the cybersecurity center in Great Britain, the transparency centers we opened up um, in Germany and Brussels, um, they are, they are uh, methodologies to address those sovereign concerns to give risk assurance and provide avenues for risk mitigation um, for those very questions that come up. So what we hear again and again, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you one more question, uh, Mr. Morrissey, and then we'll turn to Jyoti. She has some interesting things to say about India. But, but what we hear again and again is that Chinese law requires um, a 
any company subject to Chinese sovereignty right. to turn over data and cooperate with the security apparatus of China. So right. what's the firewall against well, that? Well, that gets back to the original assertion some minutes ago. It's a question of could, whether it's a, whether it's a law they're passed or just a simple statement, could the party uh, uh, make Huawei do something maligned to the benefit of its customers and, its cus and, and those customers' consumers, okay? The answer for Huawei is no. First of all, uh, Mr. Ren, the founder of the company, said he'd shut the company down before he did anything that would hurt his customers. Number two, what is the, re what is the reach? Our quest and our, and, and our, our uh, efforts over, the many, over many years has, has say, take that decision away from Huawei in essence. If you have a, a strategy, uh, whether it's global, well, it should be global, but in each sovereign area, in each market, where you have third-party verification of the product, the third-party ver verification of the operating systems, then you don't, then you lessen that, re you don't eliminate any all risk because you can't do that, but then you lessen that risk to the manageable. Okay. So uh, that would be our answer, that we have trust through verification, okay, and that verification can be done by third parties, and we've embraced that in several locales. All right, let me now turn to uh, Jyoti. Uh, she, um, how is, uh, I mean, I imagine that India has been lobbied by the U.S. to shut out Huawei. I imagine that the Chinese are actively promoting their products and services within India. How is, how is India in the middle of all this? Um, so India, the main concern with, firstly, I mean, 5G is not a monolith. I mean, there are, you know, different aspects of 5G in the technology. You have your equipment design and IP development. You have manufacturing of semiconductors, or you have service provisioning, or you have standards development. So across those four aspects itself, you know, um, there was a committee on... Um, a 5G task force that was created by the government and it came up with a report on uh, its roadmap or vision for how 5G should develop in India. And it demonstrates the uh, acceptance of where it stands in terms of its ability to participate across those four uh, different areas of uh, 5G technology development in India. It recognizes that in certain areas, Huawei is going to be indispensable in terms of the cost efficiency that it uh, affords, for example, for a large developing country like India that necessarily can't uh, afford uh, maybe allegedly more trustworthy but more expensive vendors. Um, but it also recognizes that for other, uh, there's, it also states that, you know, there is a need for cooperation between um, economies that have managed to kind of break the U.S.-China uh, monopoly on this technology development and to learn from them and chart its own way forward. But having said that, um, India and China do have a history going back years. Um, and national security is also an issue that um, has kind of regained uh, importance in our technology policy making. So not just uh, um, across, you know, uh, policies that are guiding technology de development, but also in terms of the idea that, you know, we need to uh, protect our borders. And for something like 5G, you know, uh, those concerns would be prioritized, in my opinion, uh, with what needs to be, what is needed for the domestic market, what the dom and balancing it is not an easy task, and which is why you see that there's not been a very clear position um, that's developed because you you know I mean there's security and you can't ignore those aspects and our relationship with China, but there's also the fact that you know we are a really big um, country with many citizens and we need to provide um, efficient services at low cost to them. So, yeah. So um, there's two ideas I'd like to follow up on here. We only got a few more minutes on this topic before we move to questions. Um, one of them is this business that the Huawei equipment is less expensive. Um, and this has been a debate within the United States. We actually have rural, rural telecom companies that would very much like to buy Huawei, and the Federal Communications Commission has uh, prevented them from doing that uh, through a restriction of the use of universal service funds. Uh, maybe this equipment is just cheaper because the Chinese are subsidizing it as part of their grand conspiracy to take over the world. Do you think that's true? Would anybody like to weigh in on that? Oh, you. <laughs> One point here. No, if but you, um, you, uh, I, I put it a little too comically. So, but no, seriously, I, how much of the cheapness is really 
efficiency and how much of it is uh, subsidization? Base of well, well, it's not. It's not in, in the sense, if you talk to the operators of the U.S. who purchase Huawei equipment, they're attracted to the price, but for the small, particularly for these small operators, rural operators who have uh, low budgets for uh, capex and opex. But when you talk to them, they would tell you it's the quality of service and the quality of the product okay, that attracts them, and particularly, which is one of the three pillars of Huawei's success in terms of customer customer centered focus. Okay, if you look at the issue of subsidy, we gave to the U.S. government and have continually given to the U.S. government. Uh, back as far as 2012 during the House Intelligence Committee investigation, the documentation of all the MOUs, uh, uh, documentation of our finances with all the banks we have, including Chinese banks, which are about a third of the relationships we have globally with banks. We listed out specifically where any of those uh, MOUs were utilized in terms of uh, what some could characterize as subsidy. If you look at the period, and I don't have forward data, but if you look at the period between 2007 and 2012, where Huawei had it was asserted while we had 100 billion in MOUs with Chinese banks, less than 2% of that, less than 2% over over a from 2000 in a in a market where we sold about 145 billion dollar worth of kit, okay, um, where a Chinese bank gave credit to the customer, not to Huawei. So the issue of subsidy is off the table. We gave those documentation, and that's easily third party verifiable. Any uh, entry on this, uh, John Peter, Ambassador? Uh, I, I feel like that um, we're kind of jumping around the different dimensions of the de um, debate. And I think that from a policy perspective, it's understandable, but it's also the, the, the core challenge of the 5G debate, that it has um, very different dimensions where for each question you need different uh, people at the table. If we are worried about security, the, the feature set of a particular vendor or the price point of a particular vendor uh, should not be of concern because we talk about IT security. Um, and then if we talk about, uh, from a European perspective, strengthening the European ecosystem so that in 10, 15 years, um, in an emerging technology uh, such as 5G, we still have skin in the game. Um, I want to all remind you there's a thing called Gaia-X and we kind of want to uh, jump ahead with, uh, with cloud providers 10 years too late. Um, but if we want to have skin in the game with 5G in 10, 15 years, then we talk about um, industrial policy, then we talk about trade, then we talk about the issue that uh, there's no reciprocity in the Chinese market. Um, the uh, European Commission opened in 2012 uh, an anti-subsidy, anti-dumping um, investigation against Huawei and ZTE. After two years of negotiation, um, it was dropped um, because one found a bilateral agreement with China to have a watchdog, um, to be more transparent about CapEx in the Chinese market. None of that happened. Um, so this is the trade dimension of the issue because Chinese players will be able to use economies of scale if they have a 1.3 billion customer market. That's just that's not an, a shortcoming of, um, of of China or this is just a strategic advantage, right? But then if this market is protected, which there are indicators that m maybe it is protected, um, then this is a strategic disadvantage for foreign um, uh, vendors. But that's the trade and industrial policy dimension of the issue. If we are worried about national security, um, then we have to talk about, well, how do we measure the trustworthiness of the, of the country? And do we end up to, to state in policy papers that, uh, or in, in regulation that we only buy equipment from NATO allies or from like-minded countries or from rule of law um, countries or whatever? But that's the national security dimension of it. And the, the tricky thing, in my opinion, is that the public debate conflated a lot of these. We, um, like easily one jumps around and, and, and says, yeah, well, but their equipment is better or they are cheaper or yeah, well, but there's no reciprocity. Um, when actually you need different people in the room to tackle the IT security issue, you need different people in the room to talk about trustworthiness and national security, and again, you need different people in the room to talk about the trade dim dimension and industrial policy. And for governments, and that's my last point, for governments, I think, in the looking ahead for other emerging technologies, the challenge will be to figure Absolutely. out processes, um, how to, how to um, find this balance inside the government across different ministries and bring the right people together. 
Okay, so I think it would be... Sorry, can I just come in oh, at the end there? Yeah, sorry, sorry. You're asking I didn't for know a piece, you wanted, so perhaps yeah. I could as well. Um, I mean, I think, you know, something that's important on, on the price point issue when we were thinking through this in Australia as well um, is, is that essentially because of the way that a 5G network functions, um, we just felt that actually um, if, if we felt that trust equation is not present um, and because of the nature of, you know, 5G networks are not a traditional cybersecurity issue. It's not about defending your networks against adversaries coming from outside in. It's essentially about, you know, handing over the keys to the car and being comfortable with that. And so that kind of trust takes an enormous amount of trust to be able to do that. And also the, the, the speed of high functioning um, uh, elements to the network for, you know, driving autonomous cars. It's not like you can allow at any point those signals to drop out. So the kinds of investments that we thought we would have to make in security was essentially like pouring money down a drain. And when we looked at all the mitigation strategies that we could potentially put in play in a mature 5G network, and I'm not talking about a 5G network when it first gets established, but five, ten years down the line when it's pretty much you know, ubiquitous, there's no core network identified, we, we felt that the financial investment in trying to provide assurance and security was off the scale off the charts. So, you know, for us, the kind of principle of it's low cost, whoever the vendor is, becomes null and void because of the kinds of investments we would then subsequently have to make um, for assurance and, and security off the back of that without any actual real 100% um, uh, or as far as you could get to 100% assurance that you would actually be providing any level of security at the end of that. Okay, so the, there is, uh, because of all the virtualization uh, and software in a 5G network, uh, there are cybersecurity concerns are heightened, uh, regardless of who the vendor is. We all agree on that, right? And uh, the, what you're saying is that uh, the origin, uh, no, and nobody is denying that if China is intent upon hacking your network, they will try to do so regardless of who the vendor is. Indeed, the United States has a uh, many sort of famous hacks from the from the China, which we've attributed to China, and none of them involved Huawei equipment or any kind of uh, Chinese vendor uh, flaw or backdoor. But what you're saying, uh, Ambassador Fikan, is that the increment of mistrust added by the origin of the vendor was enough to say it's easier to just lock them out of the market completely. Is that right? The trust equation is is key, but actually we did we, we looked at a whole range of mitigation strategies that you could use regardless of who the vendor was. Okay. And and actually none of them worked. So you shouldn't have five G. No, we should definitely have five G, but you need to have trust in who that vendor is. So I come back to the beginning of my response. Okay. And All if right. you can have trust in that vendor then you're in a much better position. No, nobody's going to be stupid enough and say you could have 100% security or 100% certainty in anything in life, let alone the tech space, right? All right. Um, so it's that trust equation that's key. If that was an impertinent question, I see that the record says that William Drake said it, not me. Ah. So, uh, so, so, so there. <laughs> Take it away, Bill. OK, I just want to make three quick points that I guess um, you know, uh, Milton and I are both in agreement that tech nationalism is a growing and highly problematic thing in a world of global value chains and integrated internet-based global electronic commerce. Um, and we don't want to see the world moving strongly in this direction at the same time. In this particular case, I'm a little bit more agnostic than you are. And I'll just mention three things. Um, first, you know, uh, Let's pause it at the outset. Huawei has gotten to where it is by producing good kit and producing it cheaply and forming alliances and partnerships with lots of companies all around the world. They're deeply integrated into value chains of all kinds of companies, and that's part of the challenge. Okay, so fine. That's there. Usually, as I said at the outset, techno national if you look historically, techno-nationalist strategies argued by governments very often had the backing of private sector players, that there was a real desire, almost kind of a mercantilist desire to sort of like use international trade relationships and so on to le as leverage to, to benefit particular companies. In this case, the American companies are not, by any stretch of the imagination, all of one mind on this. Um, you don't have in the United States uh, a simple situation where like the whole technology community has gotten together and said to the Trump administration, hey, try to block 
Huawei. Far from it. Many of them have been demanding waivers and getting them uh, because they're so deeply intertwined. It's costing American companies billions. So it's not, you can't really attribute, I think, this case very, and it's not clear what the, the glide path to success for American-based suppliers would be if Huawei's locked out and other, you know, Qualcomm or somebody else then is able to step forward. It's just not as obvious to me that um, the private sector aspect is a strong argument. With regard to the national security aspect, you know, sometimes when you and I have talked about this, I get the feeling that uh, because various types of people have made these arguments and some of them are ludicrous, therefore everybody's ludicrous. The fact that the Trump administration and Peter Navarro are violently anti-China doesn't necessarily mean that the positions of the intelligence community are ill-informed or subject to some sort of nativism. I'm not a network engineer. I don't have access to classified intelligence. I'm not in a position to judge for sure. I know that the, the, the Brits have come to a different uh, assessment, but there are other players with other interests, and I think it's not a, a simple thing to make this judgment as to uh, whether or not there are national security risks or not. Certainly it has been pointed out by a lot of people, with no offense to you, that Huawei uh, has been reported to be helping various authoritarian governments in Africa and elsewhere to surveil their own uh, dissident populations using Huawei technology, et cetera. These things don't help. I don't know how true all those stories are, but they're out there. Uh, that, but I, but same I thing to, could be said about Cisco, or was said about Cisco 20 years, 15 yes, but, years ago. But, yeah. but in, where Cisco comes from, we don't usually nail people to the wall. Um, one, one last point, though. Um, as, as a, well, okay, but one last point I want to make. Um, we have all through, and you referenced at the outset, we were both very involved for many years in the debates about telecom liberalization and so on. Here we're in a situation where you have one company that has, like, enormous market power. And one does have to ask the question, do you want to have a situation where with a technology that's as crucial to the future as 5G is, and I think it is, um, do you want to have one company? Why, why are the kinds of concerns that we normally would have about monopolies and market power that we've used to argue for opening up the markets to competition through regulatory action and so on, why are those not relevant here? Why, why do you want me to are answer we not that? concerned about that? Yeah. Sure. So first of all, uh, Huawei does not have market power. If you understand what 5G really is, you find a host of vendors. You find Qualcomm. You find uh, Samsung. Uh, Samsung is dominant in antennas. Uh, Huawei is more dominant in the the routers, the, the, the core network boxes. Uh, other people are going to be dominant in, in handsets. No. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, you know, what are you basing your evidence on? My concern here is actually not that, um, you know, the, the, the Huawei issue, to my mind, you know, you talk about the intelligence community and the military, that's exactly where my concerns come from, is that this whole issue of technology development and competition is being subordinated to a military agenda uh, in which the United States thinks that it can maintain its global dominance by subordinating a, any uh, country or company that, that might uh, develop the economic uh, clout that we once had and that this is turning into a cold war uh, t uh, on which technology development is the it's a perceived battleground. If that's the driver, then why is it only directed at Huawei? Why, why isn't this because atavistic is American successful... government going after all companies in all markets well, that challenge American supremacy? They're starting to do that with everything Chinese. They're talking about TikTok being a threat to national security now, so literally. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's really taken to that point. And again, I would recommend that you read this statement by uh, Christopher Lord uh, from the State Department in which he says that every Chinese vendor of every form of uh, IT equipment is exporting Chinese authoritarianism if, if we buy it. We should open up to the... Yes, we should. So, uh, you can see that we all have strong feelings about this. I imagine some of you do, too. We've got... Uh, about 17 minutes, but maybe we could stretch it a little bit more. I ask you to be uh, relatively concise um, and say who you are. 
um, prior to making your intervention. If it's a question to a particular person, please be sure that you direct it thusly. Thank you very much for the great discussion so far. My name is Daniel. I work for the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. I have one conceptual and one very practical question. Um, the conceptual question is about the external dimension of tech nationalism, and that came up a few times now, but I'd like to hear more from you on that. Um, because tech nationalism can be a domestic policy, um, but it also has an external dimension for at least some states, and the US was mentioned, China too. We may not like it, but for at least some in these states, um, technology is an instrument of power and also an instrument of external power. Of, projecting power uh, to other states. Um, so in, in a way, what, what I would say is we're witnessing now the emergence of, a, of like two competing spheres of influence. Um, we've long been accustomed to a world in which many states, companies, and individuals were dependent on technology, digital technology from the US. Um, and now we see China rising. And in that context, TikTok is interesting. Not, I, don't, I don't get what it is about. But <laughs> it's the first time that we have a Chinese social network being so successful. So what's this all on that? And then I have one very specific question for the representative of Huawei. Because I read reports um, that Huawei sued uh, three critics in France over remarks on the link between Huawei and the Chinese state. Um, so basically saying these statements are wrong, and that's why we are suing the, you. Um, can you comment on that? It's a defamation, a defamation case, yes. Yeah. <coughs> well, can I make a suggestion? It might be easier if we take all the questions and then come back to the group because okay. to make sure that we get everybody in because there's a lot of, a lot of hands. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Torsten Jelinek, director at uh, Taiche Institute. We are a small think tank focusing on China. Uh, it's a pretty simple question, uh, but maybe with a broad impact. Uh, it uh, goes to the geopolitical dimension it's about decoupling, right? This is, uh, I think we haven't addressed the decoupling. Is the world, or would the world be better off if the decoupling proceeds, you know, the scientific, technological trade, or if it doesn't succeed as we might uh, feel from the Trump administration? Thank you. Good question. Um, we, you, go, you take that side, I'll take this side, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, looking back, very much back to the Schmidt Report in the European Parliament 2001 on the Echelon uh, network. Uh, they put forward some very pragmatic issues like a mandatory source code disclosure that the European Commission should do more um, to promote open source solutions in order to create this transparency to inspect source code uh, for the wider community. And on the other hand, we see uh, like a bounce back from these old times in the trade scene uh, with the TPP, but also with the Mexican-Canadian agreement, um, like very old provisions about uh, preventing mandatory source code disclosure by governments. And uh, like a zombie uh, demand from the end of the 90s. So my question is, isn't that actually a smart thing to do, to lay open source code, not essentially open source, but like create more source code transparency to build that trust uh, that we need? It, at least in so far the software is concerned. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Zai. I'm from India. I think I'm one of the few people who would call themselves uh, tech nationalists, or uh, as some of you would refer to me as a useful idiot. But uh, it's not that I hate immigrants. It's not that I'm a Hindu supremacist. It's not that I love the people of my nation more than the people of other nations. I think when you consider it in the context of glo the Global South, you have to think uh, of nationalism at least partly as anti-imperialism, especially in uh, technology, in modern technology. And um, also the approach, the tech nationalist approach is called statist, but I would like to emphasize that it is a response to the efforts of the US state in the WTO and in other fora to entrench the status quo of uh, the concentration in digital markets. So if we constitute ourselves as a nation and want our representatives to do certain things about technology that secure our economic future, I don't think we should be called bigots for it. Uh, I don't think we should be called regressive for it. Uh, I'd also like to say that we've seen that uh, the free reign given to a few technology entrepreneurs in the US 
has pulverized American democracy. And a lot of us in India have seen that happening to our own democracy, including through Hindu supremacy. And so we don't want that to happen, and for which we need policy space in our own countries. We need space. We need less restrictions through the WTO and other mechanisms for us to be able to determine our own future. Thank you very much. Next year. Uh, this is uh, Professor Xu from the Communication University of China. And I thank you for the wonderful discussions, and uh, they are very exciting. Uh, I, th I think this is a very mighty dimensional uh, question or issue, or there are many uh, elements in it. Uh, and the answer can be very easy that uh, we need a kind of evidence based uh, approach. My question can be perhaps directed to uh, Milton or Bill. Uh, can we uh, have a, also a kind of uh, mighty stakeholder solution to such a kind of uh, mighty dimensional issue? One would hope so. You go ahead and put from over there and I'll come around. Um, yeah. yeah, these two ladies have been waiting for a while. So is he. So, so don't you want to take one on that side first and then I'll... Yeah, you're, you're up. Okay. okay. Mauro Santanillo, University of Salerno, Italy. Um, Milton Mueller said that mm, tech nationalism is linked to other forms of nationalism, and I agree. And we know that the main target of nationalism is not just globalism, but also the set of rights and uh, minorities' rights and fundamental rights. And about rights, since the um, 5G networks is based on um, virtualized and softwareized uh, infrastructure, what what about the de facto constitutional principle of the internet, the end-to-end -end argument, net neutrality? What about this kind of development? Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Wen from China. And uh, my question is, uh, I think it's a bit, uh, bit of piece of thought rather than a question, is that let's go back to the originals. That's why the 5G issue becomes a um, the, the issue of politics. Why? Because um, before that, we have 4G, we have Windows Opera systems, operation systems, and China is good with it, and we uh, adapt it. And it's all from the US, which is, uh, you, you know, uh, according to uh, many of yours, that uh, we should consider more in adapting it. But we are comfor uh, comfortable with it. But when it, uh, when it comes to 5G, everybody starts thinking that because uh, there is a, uh, national security issues and other issues. But I want to discuss why the 5G issue is becoming political. And my personal opinion is that let's keep technical things technical. And the 5G is just a, a, um, a company and it's just the techni uh, technolo technology and the company and I don't think that, and there was an ambassador from the Australia, he noticed that the, the telecom companies from Australia, they don't want uh, the uncertainties from the market, but actually the uncertainties are from government's decision. And I want to know why the Australia is taking 5G so, uh, in such a manner and what their uh, real concern is. Thank you. So can we start answering those guys because okay, we're getting so kind of diffuse. Too much. Go ahead. Yeah, Answer so I, I think really important that, you know, just on that last question because I'm sorry I do have to go at hard stop at two. Um, and, and thank you for your question. And I think sometimes it can get lost in the Australian context and the way that the media cycle works. You would think that, um, and I will say, I won't say my way, I'll say Huawei. Huawei have a, a thriving business in Australia and we fully support that. And we think that's an excellent part of market diversity. And even though we made very strong decisions back in 2012 about our national broadband network, whatever Milton might think about that, um, you know, we still have Huawei provision in our telco sector, in our internet provision, and we're quite comfortable with that, okay? But it's just the fundamental different nature of what a 5G network is, which I think we've been through during this panel, which led to a fundamental different set of decisions, which were the basis of that decision was made at a very technical level. But it's just in the modern world, you cannot now, and look at the journey we've been on with cybersecurity, right? We've had to drag cybersecurity as, as 
awesome area of work that IT professionals were doing and struggling to get visibility at the top level, and were struggling to actually get the job done because they weren't getting the institutional support and the finance for it. Now it became a strategic issue which had to have a policy context, had to have a political context as well, because that's the nature of government decision making. So therefore, it's impossible to detract, to separate the two. So, you know, the Australian decision. I've seen the complete set of evidence, you know, and I can say that it's overprivileged because I get to see all the TS level documentation. Very technical decision, but also clearly you have to have a whole range of elements to any policy decision, and key amongst those is your risk appetite. And of course that's going to have an element of risk appetite in the political sphere as much as any other area in that decision's made. So I think, you know, sometimes that granularity is lost in terms of, you know, the Australian market setting. Would, would the others, what, let, let's let the others ask their response so far and then take the last couple, don't you think? Three, all right, all right, so then let's okay. get the two Thanks. ladies Thanks, I'll, I'll try to speak quickly. Uh, my name is Kimberly Zenz, I'm from the Deutsche Cybersicherheitsorganisation, which translates as the German Cybersecurity Organization. And one thing I've heard you guys touch on a little and I was hoping you could speak a bit more, the concern that I think a lot of the issue isn't just is a company like Huawei installing backdoors right now? That has never been proven. That has never been found. There have been some efforts. It's more of the issue is, is a company, this time Huawei, involved in such critical infrastructure, but based in a country where they have no legal choice but to cooperate and share information on a level that their rivals do not? Is that something that we can work with? And I, I'm really more worried about even things like a map, like no, mapping infrastructure is something that adversaries spend months doing when they first get into a network. All that would happen, theoretically, in, principle, in, in theory, if one is worried, would be the Chinese government would request Huawei to please share this information and then share that information further with an attacker. No one would ever know there was a participant, no one would ever know where it came from, but it would still be really damaging for the users. And that sort of level of what's really unknown and how far it can be taken, I haven't really heard discussed very much in the public sphere, so I would appreciate your insights. I think we're going to have to. Okay, one more. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nandini. I'm from a civil society organization called IT for Change in India. And my question is for uh, Jyoti. So earlier you were talking about the whole debate on data governance and using it to instantiate the struggle between techno nationalist uh, perspectives and techno globalism, right? So my question is this. When we look at in the cross-border data flows governance debate, what goes as a data globalism position, typically that has been a position that has furthered the interests of one economy in the world, the United States. Like, for example, the digital to dozen principles that got made with the USTR office and Silicon Valley companies and the data globalism that pushes just like uh, protects one economy. Why is that not techno-nationalism, but what African Union countries or what India is trying to do, why is that techno-nationalism? Okay, so we've got very little time left, but we want to give you all a last word. Um, and Ambassador, is there anything else you wanted to pick up on before you, I know you said you had a, a hard stop. Okay, so let's, let's go down the line with the rest of you. And Thanks. Uh, I, I'll make it quick. So decoupling. I think um, it's, it hurts, first and foremost, innovation. Um, and we know that um, our ideas are getting harder to find. So to maintain the same level of innovation per year, we now need more and more resources to achieve that. So that, that's a natural argument for more collabor uh, collaboration than for less. And I'm, I'm pretty much worried that we will see a lot of decoupling happen, happening, especially in the, in the ICT sector. Um, regarding source code analysis, um, open source would be nice for many different reasons. Um, and I think what the HCSEC in the UK um, is doing to look at particular source code to analyze it, that helps to get a good understanding of the general quality of the software of a vendor. But it's the wrong tool if you're worried about backdoors. Be simply because of the level of complexity. Source code analysis um, is less and less meaningful in a time of hundreds of millions of lines of code. So you know wh what you are, what you are, depending on what you're worried about, source code analysis might be an answer, but certainly not for backdoors. Uh, regarding the end-to-end the -end argument, uh, what you were uh, asking, well, 
The reason is um, the, the different history of the telecommunication network and the internet. Um, we don't have end-to-end -end encryption in the uh, mobile network because historically the state wanted to have exceptional access to communication networks. This is why we have wiretap laws. So by definition, already on the standards level, um, we, we have exceptional access for law enforcement agencies. And that simply makes the, um, the network less secure by definition. Um, so there's a very good argument to make that um, in, the, uh, in, in the 5G world, maybe we need to um, adapt the telecommunication network more to the um, security and trust model of the internet, which means don't trust anybody, don't trust foreign networks, take care of your security at the endpoints of the network. We are not doing that right now. Um, so I'll take the question on uh, spheres of influence, uh, domestic and global. And that's a really interesting question. Um, because in India, for example, some would argue that the Indian government's policies have been favoring one particular telecom operator. Just a random example that I'm giving, Reliance Geo. And uh, in the past few years, there have been certain regulatory decisions that have been taken that have inevitably ended up giving it a certain preference uh, in the markets, an, an advantage in the markets. Now, that's where the domestic choices are being uh, created, where the idea that if a Reliance Geo rises and becomes a leading um, telecom player, the sheer size and number would mean that India is rising because it's a company that is equated with the national power and capacity, right? But we also have, and then going back to an issue that we discussed earlier, that there are other Chinese companies that are involved at different layers of technology development and uh, deployment. For example, in India, we have ZTE. And ZTE has close links with Reliance Geo, is also integrated into our state's broadband, um, the BSNL's networks. So why is ZTE not become the issue of contention? Is it because it has closer relationships with companies that are being heavily backed by states? And these contestations are not very clear. But it's a great point that um, the balancing between your uh, national uh, spheres of influence and your global ambitions of uh, you know, expanding your uh, influence, they kind of have to be balanced. And it's a difficult task for any government to do. On the question of uh, why um, these policies on data localization are techno-nationalist and why the fact that benefits so long flowed back to uh, a few countries or companies um, is not techno-nationalist, I think a large, of that, a large part of that answer is situated in history of why those countries or certain technologies had an advantage. Um, it's, it, it so happened that these uh, technologies developed in the U.S., you know. There was government backing into the in, an investment into developing these technologies. Um, and it didn't happen that, you know, the U.S. put in a um, policy saying that, you know, if you're using U.S. technologies, the data must stay in India. It didn't draw boundaries around the uses of that technology. In that same vein, um, it's important to acknowledge that India, too, or other countries are now adopting a very techno-nationalist agenda, uh, whether it is you know, investing in their own domestic capacities, the India stack. We have our local alternatives for payments networks, for identity solutions. So I think the historical fact that value flowed back to a few countries and companies should not be confused with strategies to expand a country's influence and question the status quo. That's where the nationalism issue comes into play. And let's remember that GAFA are not the only companies involved in the digital economy and that use data. We have run out of time. He says he will talk to, he will answer a question uh, personally. I just want to uh, respond to the Chinese uh, professor who said, can't we do more through multi-stakeholder dialogue? And the answer is yes. Quite clearly, the governments by themselves left their own devices in, in consultation with the private sector are not having the kind of dialogue that would lead us towards a really productive solution. So I think one of the things we do need to do is think about what is to be done in this space and trying to open up more opportunities for multi-stakeholder dialogue, likely we tried to scratch the surface a little bit with here, would be useful. I just want to point out before we let you go that Milton and I also have a session tomorrow at, uh, at uh, 3 o'clock to 4.30 called Digital Sovereignty and Internet Fragmentation. 
which uh, will touch on some of the same kinds of issues, but from different perspectives, et cetera. That's in Sol Europa. Uh, Milton. Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, I wanted to uh, do a little advertisement for the Internet Governance Project, which was the co-sponsor of this um, session. We have a little brochure up here if you want to know what we're about. And we are um, at the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Public Policy. and. Um, we are really focused on this issue of uh, tech nationalism and globalism and uh, sort of defending the global nature of the internet. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank our panelists, uh, particularly uh, uh, just from right to left, we have Ambassador Feekin. I'm sorry we hold, held you up, but uh, thank you very much for participating. You were great. Jan Peter, Jyoti. Excellent. Wow, yeah, yeah. Everybody gets a handshake. You get one. All right. Enjoy your lunch.